talk about what you Morning, everybody. About. Welcome back. Welcome back to the Supreme Court preview. We're delighted to have you here. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. This will be our home base, uh, room 119 for the day. Um, if there's a there's a moment after lunch where we will do sort of a choose your own adventure uh, breakout panel to talk about deep deep dives on the docket. More from me about that later, but most of the time we'll just stay right here in 119. Um, for those of you watching on Zoom, just a quick reminder that you can chat your questions to Jake Blevins. And uh, together we will we will ask them to the panel at the end of the discussion. So I'm thrilled to introduce our, our first panel of the day, which is on the Supreme Court and limits on the administrative state. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague and friend, Professor Aaron Brule. Thanks, Ali. Uh, good morning, and welcome to the panel on the Supreme Court and the administrative state. Uh, administrative law is the body of law that shapes the structure and authority of the administrative agencies that from the environment to transportation to healthcare uh, to much else uh, play such a large role in ordering modern life. Our recent years have seen several important developments in administrative law at the Supreme Court, the majority of which I think it's fair to say involve the court reducing either the authority of or the independence of administrative agencies. Last term, probably the most significant decision was West Virginia versus EPA as you may know, that case uh, limited the EPA's authority in one specific way, but perhaps more importantly for the future, it also embraced the major questions doctrine. That's a rule of statutory interpretation that requires significant regulatory actions to be justified by some clear and specific authority from Congress. Other recent terms have featured cases about the so-called independent agencies that have some insulation from presidential control. Those cases have generally reduced agency dependent, independence, uh, shifting some more authority to the president. Today's panel will address what comes next for the administrative state, both in the upcoming term and over the longer horizon. As is usual at the Supreme Court preview, we have an outstanding group to address these questions. You can find more complete bios in the online notebook, but to go in alphabetical order and just briefly introduce them, first, Beth Brinkman, Beth Brinkman's a partner in the DC office of Covington and Burling. She joined the firm after serving as Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the United States Department of Justice Civil Division, where she oversaw the division's nationwide appellate litigation. In that role, Ms. Brinkman represented federal agencies and executive branch officials in high profile cases across a broad range of subject areas. Previously, she served as an assistant to the Solicitor General briefing and arguing Supreme Court cases on behalf of the federal government. She also served as an assistant federal public defender representing indigent criminal defendants, including approximately a dozen felony jury trials. Irving Gornstein, Professor Gornstein is the executive director of the Supreme Court Institute at Georgetown Law Center, where he conducts moot courts to prepare advocates in almost every Supreme Court case. Professor Gornstein previously worked as an assistant to the Solicitor General for many years, and he returned to the Solicitor General's office as the acting principal deputy for the last six months of the Obama administration. During his two stints at the Solicitor General's office, Professor Gornstein argued almost 40 cases in the Supreme Court. Carter Phillips. A uh, partner in the Sidley Law Firm, and before that as an assistant to the Solicitor General, Carter Phillips has argued 88 times before the Supreme Court and more than 145 times before the U.S. Courts of Appeals. An academic study of Supreme Court briefs uh, over the, the period 1946 to 2013 found that Mr. Phillips was one of the most successful lawyers to argue in front of the Supreme Court. To be clear, he was not active over that entire <laughs> Competing <laughs> against, against the greats of a prior, at least two prior generations. <laughs> He's also been the co-director of Northwestern University's uh, Supreme Court Clinic. Uh, Andrew Pincus. Uh, Andy Pincus is a partner at the law firm of Mayor Brown, where he focuses his practice on briefing and arguing cases in the Supreme Court of the United States and federal and state appellate courts. And he also presents policy and legal arguments to Congress, state legislatures, and regulatory agencies. A former assistant to the Solicitor General, 
Uh, Mr. Pincus also co-founded and serves as co-director of Yale Law School Supreme Court Advocacy Clinic, which provides pro bono representation to 10 to 15 Supreme Court cases each year, along with his private work at the firm. Uh, he's also served as general counsel to the United States Department of Commerce. Uh, last but not least, James Stern. Uh, James Stern has been on the faculty here since 2013. His scholarship concerns property, private law theory, intellectual property, privacy, and related issues. His articles have been published in leading law reviews and have been cited by various courts, including the United States Supreme Court. Uh, recently, Professor Stern uh, spent some time at, as Deputy General Counsel at the United States Department of the Treasury. In that capacity, he oversaw major, major Treasury Department litigation before the Supreme Court and other courts, worked on national security issues, including sanctions, and helped spearhead the development of cryptocurrency regulations. So I will pose questions to our panel of appellate and regulatory heavy hitters, and I'll also reserve some time for questions from the audience. So let's go ahead and get started. First, uh, over the next couple of years, what moves do you see happening in the Supreme Court? And this could be near term, say, especially important cases this term, uh, but also over the longer horizon, what are some issues that are bubbling up in the lower courts that may find themselves on the Supreme Court's docket uh, over the, the medium term? So, any of you are welcome to go first. I'll jump in on the major questions, Doctor, which you already mentioned. I think that's the place to start here. And um, in that case, the Supreme Court had a um, rule under the Clean Air Act. And so the question was, you know, whether that was valid or not. And the Supreme Court struck it down and really articulated this doctrine, and, but applied it with four factors in that particular case. And the question's going to be whether that is kind of how I think it develops in the lower courts. These issues have been raised in so many courts already, and whether or not um, the kind of the four factors that the Chief Justice's majority opinion talks about, or Justice for such as concurrence, which is almost 20 pages long, whereas the Chief Justice's discussion of this issue was about nine. Um, so there's going to be a lot of play in there and what that really needs. And what the Chief Justice's majority opinion says is, you know, this is an extraordinary case. This is an extraordinary case where um, it was a kind of obscure provision. I, I have to say, I could refute all of these because I argued the other side of the case, but this is what the majority opinion does. Well. Just wanted to say, yeah. um, so the majority opinion, it was an obscure provision, I would say not, but obscure provision, um, a new interpretation um, in the 40 years since, and it affected a major political, economic, social issue. But the fourth one was also something Congress had considered authority giving to the agency and decided not to. So all of that combined together, you know, in the majority opinion to do that analysis and calling it an extraordinary case. Whereas the dissent said, this is just statutory interpretation. We look at the text, we look at the structure of the statute, and we look at the purpose. And that's how Justice Kagan, in a very well-written um, dissent, <laughs> explains you know, the, the prior case law. But so you have this majority opinion, which really focuses on the particular case and doesn't decide the issue that um, the petitioners actually wanted. They wanted a rule that said the statute is limited to, um, it was about power plants and how they could meet certain emissions um, limits. And so the petitioners wanted the rule to say power plants can meet these emissions limits only by um, changes in technology to their individual plants or their smokestacks. And the rule that said, no, they can also meet those emissions limitations by um, doing generation shifting or you know, having less of their dirty plants um, produce energy and more clean energy plants produce it. And the court said, no, but they did not decide that initial issue. They just said, Congress wasn't clear enough. This is this extraordinary case and we're throwing out the rule on that. So I think that's where there's gonna be a lot of development um, between those views of what that doctrine now even means. Um, so maybe just to zoom out a little bit, it's sort of maybe I don't know it was a sleepy backwater for a while, but I guess Carter and I were in the SG's office a while ago. And in those ancient times, um, the government 
didn't lose virtually any or certainly any significant cases involving administrative agency power. You know, the government, I, I think the court sort of viewed the federal government as a beneficent force and maybe agencies as part of that. And I think we've had a total role reversal. And I think this court is extraordinarily skeptical about administrative agencies and about uh, the fact that they wield power in ways that perhaps the framers didn't exactly anticipate. So if you sort of think about what's happening, you can put it into three buckets. One is structure. Um, as Aaron mentioned, you know, there was a tradition of agency heads or commissions, the alphabet soups of agencies, SEC, blah, 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 um, being insulated for presidential removal. The president can only remove them for cause uh, as opposed to plenary authority to remove the heads of other agencies. Uh, that's sort of been whittled away. And I think we could talk about how it's going to whittle away further. Uh, the court is quite skeptical of uh, any insulation of significant people wielding significant power from plenary presidential authority. Um, second, regulatory authority. You can look at the major questions doctrine decision as, as one of several moves the court has made to make it more difficult for agencies to issue regulations. That's one, less statutory authority. Uh, if you think about the Regents' opinion in the DACA case from a few years ago, uh, where there was a change in position, the court has made it very difficult for agencies to change position. Uh, they've got to consider a whole range of reliance factors, and it's pretty easy if you look at the decisions in the lower courts for people who are challenging the change in position to say, well, here's something you've not, you didn't you didn't address. And if you are before a court that's skeptical about agencies also, that's going to win. And then the third category, and the one I think is going to come to the fore maybe this coming term, is agency adjudication authority. Um, most Many federal agencies think of the SEC, have enforcement authority, they can go to court, file a civil complaint, or they can bring an enforcement action through their own administrative law judge, ALJ apparatus. And for decades. They've sort of been able to choose between the two, uh, and the administrative uh, enforcement authority has sort of been unquestioned, but that is now <clears throat> significantly under attack. I'll mention one pair of decisions we could talk about more later. Uh, the court, I, I think before recent times, people would say, if you were the target of an administrative agency action and you thought maybe the agency was acting unconstitutionally, uh, that was great, but you would have to wait until that agency process ended. And then when you sought review of the agency decision, if you lost, you could raise your constitutional questions in court. Um, recently, parties have begun to challenge that and said, why can't we go to court right away? to challenge the constitutionality of that agency process. The agency can't really rule on constitutional issues. Uh, so we should be entitled rather than being subjected to this unconstitutional proceeding to be able to go to court just when the administrative proceeding starts uh, and seek to stop it. And that's important because if you're a regulated entity, you usually don't like to get into a long-term fight with your agency and you certainly don't wanna have an adverse decision at the end of the road. So if you have to go through the process, there's a lot of pressure to settle. If you can bring your constitutional claims at the beginning, why not? Maybe you'll win. Uh, and the Supreme Court has a pair of cases before it, one from involving the FMC and one involving the SEC that raised this question. The Fifth Circuit said, actually, you can go to court right away. No need to wait. If you have a constitutional challenge to the agency process, you can go to court and have it adjudicated and you can put the agency process on ice. The Ninth Circuit in an FTC case reached the opposite conclusion. Uh, and the court's gonna resolve that question this term. And that will obviously be really important in terms of the ability of parties to actually assert and get adjudicated these constitutional challenges. And we can maybe talk later about what they may be. <clears throat> I was just going to add one point to, to what Andy said, which is in three and a half years of the Solicitor General's office, I worked studiously to figure out how to use the word deference in every paragraph that I wrote and every opinion and every brief that I filed. Uh, and then I spent the next 40 years of my career trying to figure out how to get rid of that. <laughs> so the concept, from my perspective, purely as a, as a practitioner who represents the business community and therefore the most part the regulated community is the idea of being able to litigate on, a, on an even playing field with federal agencies, uh, at least for the last part of my career, seems like a, 
gift from God, even though it's coming from some other source. Um, but it will be, it, but it'll be interesting. And, it'll, and obviously, we're not going to start immediately on a, on a level playing field. There are going to be uh, a series of actions that are going to have to be taken before we figure this out. And I'm pretty sure at the end of the day, the course is not going to completely eliminate deference. I, I, you know, it's, it was Justice Breyer's example that he repeatedly used in various contexts about at what point are courts going to take over the task of deciding how many elements of a moiety need to be in something in order to make it good, bad, or indifferent as a matter of regulatory law? And the answer is, you know, clearly not something a court's going to want to deal with. So there's always going to be, there will always be some kinds of issues that I think the courts are going to want to defer to. But they don't say they're deferring to it. They're still not going to second guess certain kinds of certain kinds of decisions. But recognizing that they're going to want to keep some element of deference in there. Now we're going to have to litigate about, about the boundaries of it. There's no question the major questions doctrine. It's not intuitive. What's major and what's not will be a source of unending fights. And my clients, you know, for years have been complaining about agencies, decision-making processes that seem to them at least inherently unfair where, where the prosecutorial role and the judicial role blend. And even though you maintain the independence of the administrative law judges, the sense that, that this is a process that's not really neutral and detached uh, is a serious concern. Uh, and it'll be interesting whether the court, I mean, we've all accepted it. It's been around since Lord knows I went to law school and, and, and a well-accepted view of the world. It'll be interesting to see how the court decides to play that out. Could I um, just elaborate a little on uh, taking off from where Beth was? And by the way, if you want to see a brilliant oral argument, um, take a look at Beth's argument in, the, uh, in that case was just a terrific argument. Um, so I think the chief, as, as Beth pointed out, um, said this is for the exceptional case. Um, and I think what we're going to find out, at least in the lower courts, is it's forever major, major rulemaking, um, which um, I guess you could call ever major rulemaking the exceptional case, but it will, uh, at, at least that's how it's going to be argued out by the industry. Um, and a lot depends, as, as I would second what Beth said about how many of these factors you think are enough to trip off um, this major questions doctrine? Uh, because if you're in the uh, Justice Gorsuch camp, um, it's really an either or of one of two factors. It's a big deal politically or it's a big deal economically. And if you, if you view uh, that the doctrine as being set off by anything that's a big deal politically, or anything that's a big deal economically, I think you've pretty much covered the waterfront of major uh, administrative action. So, yeah, <laughs> yes, and I would not call those maybe major administrative actions. Um, so yes, if they wanna you know, do a little bit here, a little refining here, a little refining there, um, that, that would be not tripping off the document. And I do, you know, I, I, I hear Carter's uh, saying and, and I, I understand the, the sympathy of those who said the, the deck, sh deck should not be stacked in favor of the agency. I get that argument, and we want to play on an equal playing field. I get that argument. But actually, this doctrine stacks the deck in the other direction. It does not put everybody on an equal playing field. Some of the cases that the court relied on were equal playing field cases, like King v. Burwell, where the court said there's no way this power was delegated to uh, you know, the Treasury Department to decide whether there should, should be subsidies. But then the court went up on to uphold the agency's interpretation on a straight up view of what Congress intended. Here, the, once it sets aside the agency's Chevron authority, it doesn't go on to then decide that the question straight up. It says the agency loses unless Congress has clearly and specifically given authority once you're in this territory. So I, I feel like that's a pretty, pretty dramatic move. Um, it's, don't get me wrong, some of the cases are there and I'm not gonna say um, there isn't some support in prior cases 
for this move, but in almost every case before this, but almost every case, it either was a case where a, a King Third Burwell type of case where they said, we're not going to look to the agency, we'll then interpret it straight up. Or it was a case where the case was basically decided on other grounds, and this was added as an additional feature. And so starting moving this up to the top, um, the first case I could find that did that was last term, uh, where it was moved up to the top, and it was in the uh, OSHA case. The first time it didn't <clears throat> fall at the end after the case was kind of already decided as an additional reason, it was moved up to the top. And that's a, a very significant development. The second thing I would want to say, say about it is I don't think you can understand what's going on with me question without understanding what's going on in delegation. Um, and there's been a very dramatic move from the from in, in dramatic, uh, uh, from the right side of the court on its um, concern about delegation of legislative powers to administrative agencies. So if you go back to Justice Scalia, um, laughed off, and it really just laughed off as not a serious argument delegation in the last big delegation case. And it was a pretty serious delegation question, but he bought into the idea that Congress can set very general standards, basically cost benefit or even less than that. And, and that's good enough um, under the delegation doctrine. This is not a court. And now we had uh, a dissent in Gundy that was joined by, I think three members of the court, and, but including the chief. Um, which said that idea of delegation is just wrong. And what delegation <clears throat> means is agencies can pick up like fine details, but they can't make major questions. They can't decide major questions. Only Congress can decide major questions. And I think we can't understand this move to major questions as a matter of interpretation without understanding that there's own, probably a majority of the court that thinks that's constitutionally required right now, that agencies not be allowed to decide major questions. And so this doctrine, what it effectively does is except in the rare case when Congress is actually clear in giving an agency very broad powers, um, it, it really uh, moots the delegation question entirely and, and, and cuts things off right at the pass uh, as a matter of statutory interpretation. And I would say Justice Gorsuch talked a lot about those constitutional issues in his concurrence. He really sees it that way. I could jump in for a second for the benefit of uh, those who are in the audience who may not be as expert in administrative law. So you've heard some discussion of deference. And so the leading deference doctrine uh, which you may have heard of is Chevron. And so it had its start in the mid eighties and it was sort of came from humble beginnings to be one of the most cited cases ever. And as some of our alumni from the Solicitor General's office have said, it was routinely cited and uh, routinely helped the government win cases where a regulatory statute was vague or used general terms like set you know, reasonable limits or regulate pollution from stationary sources. Okay, what's reasonable? What's a stationary source. Is that one factory, a whole complex of buildings? Uh, the government would be allowed to interpret those terms, and as long as it interpreted them in a reasonable way, the government could prevail. And uh, more recently in the Supreme Court, the court's been uh, neglecting the doctrine, so failing to mention it in cases where it seems like it should be mentioned. Some justices have challenged its constitutionality, uh, and then there have been all these carve-outs. So the major questions doctrine seems like one of those carve-outs. Certain categories of cases that won't be eligible for the Chevron treatment because they're too important. Um, now, it sounds like from what Carter said, you think the period of maximum risk for Chevron is passed in terms of overruling, that it probably won't be overruled, but its future is to be cut back and limited in various ways, major questions and others. So is that the sense of the rest of you as well, that the Chevron doctrine is not likely to be overruled, but it's not likely to be very important in the future. So 
the dead case walking. Okay. Uh, you know, there were a number of statutory interpretation cases this term where the party, there was one case where one of the questions was, should Chevron be overruled? And there was some discussion of that in the oral argument. But I think in the real world, uh, no advocate is going to rely on Chevron at the Supreme Court uh, because it will not be persuasive. And probably if there is a case that squarely presents it, it would get overruled. But I think uh, nobody is basing statutory interpretation arguments on Chevron anymore. And the court doesn't, and, and what's shocking is in all of these statutory interpretation cases where Chevron was debated, as you mentioned, it didn't make it into any opinions. To reinforce that in one brief that's on for this term, um, it's a statutory um, construction question under the Clean Water Act. And in the Solicitor General's brief, defending uh, you know, the, the government action here, it says, it cites an older case and says, in that case relied on Chevron. And you know, that's our position now. And the other side hasn't asked that Chevron be overruled. <laughs> they didn't invoke Chevron. They didn't ask for deference. Of course, the reply brief came back and said, oh, the government's asking for deference and all that. But even the Solicitor General in that pointed out that Chevron favored them, but did it in a very understated way, to say the least. But you know, the one thing that you got to keep in mind, though, without having, having not expressly overruled Chevron, lower courts are still going to have issues. I mean, the D.C. Circuit is still going to get a lot of administrative law questions. And I'm pretty sure that the same restraint that you'd see in the Solicitor General's briefs of not invoking Chevron is not going to happen in the, in the run mine of briefs that get filed by the United States government and all of those agencies. I, mean, it, it, I think there are too many computers where you can hit a button and with deference to prevent that from happening going forward. And those courts are still going to have to figure out what do we do in these situations? And and I don't think the Supreme Court's gonna, re gonna review every DC circuit decision that happens to either cite Chevron or make reference to the word deference. So um, it'll be a, at least some tension in terms of how, how the Supreme Court kind of plays this out. Now, it, maybe it all collapses because if the non-delegation doctrine gets a significant play, so that you just, you know, you gotta take a lot more off the table Whatever, whatever makes its way through as a as a delegated authority, you know, probably what you want, you know, if it's clear enough to get get that through, and you have a good regulation, maybe then the rule uh, will hold up. The other aspect of this whole process that still I, I find I don't know, disturbing, I suppose, is and and it comes and it comes out of the same stuff when when the court decided to eliminate legislative history is you, you know Congress is sort of acted on reliance on how the Supreme Court was going to behave and passed God knows how many statutes on the assumption that they didn't have to be all that clear in delegating authority. They didn't have to be all that clear. Uh, you know, these, all these clear statement rules you know, didn't exist. So they passed legislation. And so it's a little, I mean, it's a little disturbing to me, for, you know, in the, in the name of protecting separation of powers to, uh, Essentially, you just throw aside what all of those Congresses did because they couldn't anticipate that the court was going to make a fundamental change in the way it invoked judicial review 20, 10, 20, 30, 40 years later. I, uh, to answer uh, your question, Aaron, uh, I do not think the, the, um, the point of, of maximum risk of, uh, of overturning has passed. Um, the, the trouble is Chevron. I mean, they're, they're, they're uh, sort of conceptual and uh, justificatory problems. Like it's a little, it's a bit, it, in, in just the, the idea that, well, the statute, uh, if the terms of a statute are unclear, that represents a uh, choice by Congress to delegate to an agency is, is clearly at least somewhat of a fiction. Um, statutes are unclear all the time where there's no agency involved. And we don't imagine that that represents a delegation to anyone. So um, that idea is a little bit unstable. The, the notion that whenever it's unclear, basically the government should win is a little unstable. The way it uh, it plays out uh, as at least you know, when I was uh, uh, in the government, I think we sort of viewed it as a principle that if we could come up with a plausible, uh, colorable uh, legal argument, we ought to win. Uh, that's what it means. And I think it's it can be taken that way. All of that I think is is problematic. There are uh, situations where what it does is quite, uh, I think, uh, at least in my own judgment, is quite justifiable, and I think there are, there are good reasons uh, for that. But the question is whether that can be articulated 
uh, clearly enough. Um, and I think that can be sort of difficult to do to, um, uh, to set up a clear test that would narrow uh, what Chevron does to the kinds of cases where what it represents is really appropriate. So factor into that, uh, that the, the court seems to be willing to um, uh, to overturn a significant precedents uh, rather than sort of keep them around on, on, on a sort of fig leafy life support um, and these, these problems that exist. And then one more piece, which is that there's a backstop behind all this in Skidmore deference, that a more uh, amorphous and kind of general uh, idea of uh, deferring to, to agency wisdom to the, to the extent it's sort of present. And I think that also kind of lowers the stakes uh, of, of getting rid of Chevron in a way. So um, I think there's definitely a very live and real possibility that it goes away, but there's also lots of other variables that, that can matter in terms of uh, just, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, presidential elections and uh, who's on the and all kinds of things like that in the years ahead. But um, long term on the path things are going, I think there's a substantial chance of, of it being overruled. So I'm, I'm in the same camp on I think it's still a, a very live issue. And part of the reason I think that is it's completely irresponsible for the Supreme Court not to take a case and decide whether to overrule Chevron when under their doctrines, lower courts are bound to apply that doctrine. And, and, and they would get summarily reversed or, or under current Supreme Court precedent, they should get summarily reversed if they say, well, we've noticed the Supreme Court hasn't been applying this lately, so we're just going to take it as it being overruled. Courts of appeals and, and district courts are not free to do that at all. And, and so I think the court eventually is going to have to take a case um, to say this. The other reason I think that is the government is still defending Chevron. It's true that the government um, understands, as everybody here understands, that citing Chevron is not going to get you anywhere in the Supreme Court. Um, it's, a, it's a complete waste of time. But still, in the latest um, op and in, in bump stock case, uh, the, uh, the Solicitor General has said Chevron should not be, or the case for overruling Chevron has not been made. In the, in the case that on, um, I'm forgetting the name of the case that Don Verrilli argued this term, the government did argue as, as a backup position that yes, we're right straight up, but if we're not right straight up, we should prevail under Chevron. And it's true, the court said not a word about that. Um, and, but the government is still there um, defending Chevron. And, and, and so I do think at some point, the two things I've talked about together are gonna force the court um, to confront this issue and, and decide. Now it's true, there may be some things, you know, pre-Chevron, um, there was pre-Chevron law where sort of questions, mixed questions of uh, where everybody agreed on the meaning and you were applying the meaning to a set of facts and, you know, people refer to that as mixed questions and sometimes that's de novo and sometimes it's deferential. In that sphere, I can see Chevron still operating and, and the court saying that's fine. Um, but in the area where it's just an interpretation uh, of the meaning of words, I think um, five and possibly six justices will overrule Chevron eventually. When you think of that, you have to think of what it's going to be replaced by, though. I think the idea of the D.C. Circuit and lower courts of appeals needing to do something to interpret regulatory action is really important, right? There's got to be some kind of framework. And in fact, I think that the major questions doctrine now makes it easier to let Chevron sit for a while because the really troubling cases, they can get rid of that way. And so, you know, for the courts of appeals, I think they're going to be looking to the government. It was mentioned, you know, when you're in the government, you're justifying these regulations. So I think that there's going to be a lot more effort to try and explain the history, why this is consistent with earlier action of the government. There can be a real effort there. And, and one overarching principle, I think, of this kind of review is some of the that Justice Kagan mentions is like, is the agency operating outside of their, you know, lane? Have they moved outside of the lane? You know, is it an eyebrow raising case? And 
On the Supreme Court, I think we can tell something from these vaccine cases. Um, Herb was mentioning that they didn't use the word major question, doctor, but there were two cases in um, January of 2022 about vaccines. I think it's going to show you the important roles that the Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh play in this area because their votes went differently in those two state cases. And I think it's because they thought in the one case, the agency was operating outside of their lane and not in the other. So they agreed to strike down the nationwide vaccine that the Department of Labor had imposed on every large employer across the country. Yet those two voted to uphold the vaccine requirement that HHS, that Health and Human Services, imposed on health workers in programs that were under their agency. Um, you know, that's a real demarcation. I think when you start looking at that, you're going to see that the Supreme Court, you know, isn't going to throw out everything that agencies are doing. And there has to be some kind of framework for that. And I do wonder, if not Chevron, I mean, there is skid more deference, but I always like to say skid more deference is like, does it make sense? Is it well reasoned? You know, which is kind of the standard that courts apply anyway. I've never thought skid more was much deference. So I think that it, there's less likelihood to overrule Chevron at this point. And I think the lower courts, particularly the DC Circuit, who has this administrative law as their bread and butter, is going to need something and you know try and apply it in a way, even if they don't cite it, in a way that looks to the expertise of agencies, because there are you know situations where the agency is much better positioned than the court to start implementing these kinds of policies. If we could, I'd like to look now to the the, the longer term. Right? So if we take a long view and ask, where are these trends heading? What's the end state that the court has in mind? And to me, at least, it's not entirely clear. And you could compare that with, say, in the area of reproductive rights, where it's clear what the majority, what the desired end goal is. It's Roe versus Wade is overturned. And the question is, well, tactically, does that happen by steps or all at once? And what year exactly? But it's pretty clear what the, the end state would be. Um, but here, what is the end state? So is it uh, no independent agency? So overruling cases like Humphrey's executor that said some agencies uh, can have insulation from presidential control. Is that it? Is it no administrative law judges doing adjudications within agencies? Instead, that needs to be done by the life tenured federal courts. Is it instead um, a strong non-delegation doctrine that's been mentioned that say in Justice Gorsuch, Gorsuch's vision, the agency can only fill up little details, but can't do anything very significant. So which of those or something else or all of them is the end state, do you think? Or do you think the court knows? Or is it they're still sort of working towards something that's in, in the becoming still? I think some are clearer than others. I do think that Humphrey's executor is going to get confined to its facts and the court's going to find that, you know, with the exception of the Federal Reserve, there aren't any agencies that are fit within Humphrey's executor and therefore all of the commission's uh, members of these alphabet soup agencies will be subject to plenary presidential removal. That's there already are decisions in the lower courts based on the Supreme Court's most recent decision involving the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. One of them said that the PSC members have to be removable at will and there are challenges to the FTC pending. So I, I think that is probably the easiest to say. On adjudications, I don't think it's, uh, to me at least, it's not that clear. Uh, I think there's a lot of skepticism about administrative adjudication uh, and whether it's fair and or whether it, there's sort of a home cooking kind of flavor to it. Uh, I think removal of ALJs at will may come and then maybe people will say, well, if they're removable at will, is this really a fair proceeding if they're subject to sort of the whims of the executive? And so maybe the whole thing collapses. And then there's a recent Fifth Circuit decision that basically says some of the kinds of claims that are subject to those adjudications have a jury trial right attached to them, so they'd have to be brought in court definitively anyway for that reason. So I think, to me, TBD, but cutting back on adjudication. And I think on the rulemaking side, you know, as I said before, if you add up all of these limitations on agencies, the major question doctrine, the region's decision that requires much more sort of explanation and discussion of agency rules, 
uh, the non-delegation issues, the changes, um, and just the general skepticism that there is now sort of abroad in the courts about agencies, I think rulemaking is hard and it's gonna get harder for agencies to, to get their rules through this process. And, you know, to me, there's just the end, you know, there's a sort of an interesting or sort of maybe scary systemic effect. If you look at how our system is functioning now, Congress really isn't able to deal with major questions very effectively. And if agencies can't deal with major questions at all, then you have a real question about how the federal government will be capable of responding to these kinds of issues uh, as they arise, which they're bound to do. I think the practicalities of how this is going to play out for the federal government is really troubling. Um, you know, we, a lot of the these appointments issues started with the recess appointments clause, which we litigated for several years in the Obama administration. And issues then were like, what is the remedy going to be? What are we all doing? Now the court has created all these remedies that are so atextual. They'll say, oh, we're just going to take away this power. They're not going to be reviewable by here. Now they can be removable, having nothing to do with the text that Congress enacted. But that remedy issue had been hanging over there. So now, you know, there are a lot more of these issues that have come about of all kinds of points issues and removable issues. And I think that's made it easier because there's a path there. But so many of these cases have been litigated in the context of significant financial interests, like the SEC, that type of thing. What about the social security benefits and the administrative law judges that do that? The impact of this on the government is so broad. And I think that that is something that at some point has to put some kind of pause on this. I think the, uh, you know, imposition of additional safeguards and different kinds of appointment schemes, but at some, some way it has to continue to function. So I, I'm going to be very interested to see how it plays out, but at some point the practicality of the government working is going to have to come into play. So I'll answer your question specifically. I, I think if, I think what the end and state is, although I suspect different justices may have a slightly different vision of what it would be. But I think at the end of the day, there's a majority of the court that would like to get administrative agencies back to their vision of how separation of powers ought to operate, which is that the agency doesn't have legislative authority. So that its rulemaking powers are limited to dealing with filling in truly interstices of small matters, not major matters, that agencies shouldn't be in a position where their adjudicatory authority essentially deprives uh, parties of their opportunity ultimately to go to court because the interim effect of that process operates in a particular way. So you cut back significantly on the adjudicatory one. I was thinking the same thing about the disability claims. I, I'm pretty sure that the court's not going to want to adopt a rule that ends up with all of the immigration cases and all of the disability cases being litigated in federal district courts. I mean, I, I don't know how many, I mean, you just, you know, just open the door and let all everybody in as a federal judge, I think at that point, because we don't have any other way to do it. But, you know, and that, but that the agencies then in that world, putting aside the problem I just identified, would be more in the nature of an enforcement mechanism uh, accountable to the president, both for getting in and and staying in, and that and that their primary mission will be to send out indications as to how they plan to enforce the law, which which are binding perhaps on the agency but not on the general public. And then when you litigate those issues, then you're going to have to seek skid more deference, which, as far as I'm concerned, means. You get upheld when you're right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Seems reasonable to me. <laughs> Same deference as a law review article, as Justice Scalia once said. <laughs> no need to footnote. <laughs> um, so I, I'm, uh, I think there are three uh, votes for sure to burn down the House. Um, and there are another, um, at least uh, one who's probably there also, uh, but then uh, you have two who I think are rein, or, rein in, um, but leave something significant left over and, um, and are gonna be much more uh, pragmatic about it. So um, 
you know, we're talking about benefits cases, and maybe all of them that will say this about benefit cases, there's an exception for benefit cases. <laughs> we're just talking about private rights, because after all, I mean, you, you can doctrinally um, make that line work if you want to, um, but it really is just, okay, a practical concern that we don't want to flood the federal courts with benefit cases. Um, but uh, similarly, there'll be an exception, I think, for the Federal Reserve. They'll figure out some way um, to carve off the Federal Reserve, whether it's history or something. But I, you know, what's really going in their mind is, do you really want Donald Trump running the Federal Reserve? And um, I think there's, you know, there, there are going to be at least five justices who think that's not a great idea. And um, so... That, I think, is the end game, is to rein in very, very substantially, but to not uh, burn it all down in a way that's going to create uh, consequences that a majority of the court don't think um, we should have to work with. I, I agree with some of that, and, and, and maybe not some of the, 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 the particulars. I, for example, in the benefits question, just, you know, just to bring a little idealism to the room, uh, there's a long-standing doctrinal distinction between so-called public rights and, and private rights, and one can immediately grasp the difference between a social security benefits determination and getting fined by the government for some kind of wrongdoing. That's, uh, I think, a sort of intuitive uh, type of distinction. Not One doesn't have to be a deep legal realist uh, uh, to, to draw on that, and it's, and it's in the doctrine. But in, in terms of the overall sense of where things are going, uh, to zoom out, uh, as, as Andy put it, um, I, I regard what's going on as uh, significant but not transformative. I, and that my, my prediction is that that's sort of what, where things end up, that there is more legal scrutiny. Um, but if you, if you think of maybe of, the, of your three buckets, the most significant being the, the regulatory piece, um, the activity in, you know, published on a daily basis in the Federal Register is not going to be dramatically curtailed. In the grand scheme of things, um, the regulatory state that we have, um, I do not think is going to be dismantled. The house is not going to be burned down. Um, and uh, uh, substantial discretion uh, in agencies to undertake actions is going to remain. But uh, there is uh, definitely uh, much more uh, of, a of a watchdog that's going to be imposed through the courts and the, the leash is going to be shorter. Um, but I don't view it as uh, kind of fundamentally transformative. But we'll see. I mean, the major questions doctrine, just how uh, how uh, tight a filter that's going to prove to be is is out there. There are kind of two paths. Is it exceptional or is it uh, anything that's big? Um, I suspect it really will be more on the kind of exceptional eyebrow razor uh, track uh, rather than just anything that's big. But I could be wrong, and that would be uh, substantially different. Thank you all for responding to my questions. I'd now like to give the audience a chance to ask questions of their own. Um, yes, please. I'd like to know whether Congress has feelings about these things. Uh, you mentioned that uh, they're lackadaisical about letting uh, the courts settle stuff. You know, late, this, we've done enough, we've done what we could. What's the source over time? all these statutes that are allegedly vague. Why are, why are they vague? Are they vague only because somebody, the sponsors couldn't get it, couldn't get all that they wanted, so they left it open like that to see if they could get it? So what, when you look at these statutes, I, I don't, what are they like? Public convenience and necessity. That's the standard one, right? What satisfies the public convenience and necessity? Leave it to the agency to make that decision. Well, with, on, under that standard, given an area of subject matter regulation, regulatory authority, what can't you put in there, especially if you defer to the agency's own assessment of what's in the public interest? So you put in what you can, well, I think it's, I mean, those, but that standard was upheld in the 1930s and it's been in the books. So, you know, why would Congress deviate from it? I mean, you know, not, not every statute obviously follows exactly the same delegation of authority, but that's, you know, it's basically the pattern that's been followed. And 
virtually all of the regulatory agencies is very broad grant of authority with spe certain specific grants on certain kinds of rulemakings, et cetera. But typically the, that's been upheld. And now the question is, did, you know, did they just go too far? Congress go too far way back when? And even though it would be better, I suppose, if we were making these decisions in 1940, so that we didn't end up with 80 years of regulatory history to sort out, um, uh, not much I can do about that at this stage. Certainly that's the way the justices are going to feel about it. Does Congress have feelings about this? Yeah, I'm sure it does. But I don't, I doubt that it has a uniform feeling about it. I'm sure half of them think this is the greatest thing that's ever happened and half of them think it's the worst thing that's ever happened because that's pretty much how we all split anymore. And I would just say in the EPA case, it wasn't the statute was just vague. I mean, the statute said, you know, the, the, the agency has to figure the best system of emissions reduction. And then there's a bunch of other language. The question was whether that was adequately clear to justify this program and how they implemented that. So I do think it changes that dialogue that Congress and the court has, you know, the theory is Congress can say it means X and if Congress disagree, I mean, the Supreme Court can say it means X and if Congress disagrees, they can change it and say, that's not what we meant. And they have done that. Now though, the Supreme Court didn't really decide what it meant. It just decided it didn't mean this and it, it didn't go so far as what the other side wanted to uh, ask it to say. So I think that does change as Carter was saying, the relationship between Congress and the court and what Congress might react to that. Also, it was a very old provision in a statute, but it was purposely written to give the agency, you know, expertise with the science and all develop something over time. So I think that's a good question. You know, what do you do with an issue that's going to be very much evolving through science and all? What can Congress do to give enough guidance? That is um, challenging in light of that decision. Yeah, drafting statutes is actually pretty hard. I think the court sees an end product and you know, isn't there, if you've ever done, engaged in that exercise, you're trying to draft language. I mean, part of it is, are the kinds of standards Carter mentioned where, you know, there's gonna be broad discretion and you wanna cap it. But a lot of it is you're writing a provision to deal with a couple of problems that are right before you, but it's going to probably be applied to problems that you haven't thought of, maybe that haven't arisen. And so it's not unusual that the statutory language is not a great fit for problems that people didn't actually specifically anticipate because it's really hard to do. And so, you know, the notion that Congress is sort of lazy or, you know, they just don't care, it's actually really hard. And I think part of the court's jurisprudence now doesn't really account for the fact that you're mm -hmm. writing to deal with a set of problems that exist and a set of problems that arise, and it's really hard to do. And so it's, it's a reason why looking at context and what Congress was really trying to get at you know, King v. Burwell is a good example of that, to sort of figure out how these specific words fit when they're trying to be applied to something that Congress probably didn't directly anticipate. It's worth pointing out that the justice who probably had the most experience with Congress, Justice Breyer, is now no longer on the court. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. All the way in the back, Bertrand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what is the new question can The, since the, I'm not sure if the mics will reach all to the back for those who are on Zoom, the question is about the prospective effects of the non-delegation doctrine and major questions doctrine. 
I think Irv mentioned action before. I think they're the flip side of the same thing. And I think that Justice, um, you know, of course, such really sees it that way. You know, non-delegation is to say that if Congress is going to give agency some kind of authority, there has to be an intelligible principle for the agency to apply. Um, and really the major questions, Doctor, and I think is very much that you didn't give the agency an intelligible principle to apply because this is really outside of their lane. It, it wasn't clear enough. So I do think that the major questions doctrine and the non-delegation doctrine are very much connected. Um, doctrinally, I don't know how much it's really connected to Chevron. I think it takes things off the table as folks here were saying, and then allows lower courts to, I that they have to continue to apply Chevron or some kind of framework for all the rest of the everyday cases where there's more than one way to implement or interpret a statute and a regulation and an agency has decided one way and it's you know reasonable. So there's going to have to be some framework on that. So I think that is not um, you know such part of this constitutional debate. I don't know. So I you know I think there's a big debate that's going to occur within the court or whether it's a big deal doctrine or whether it's an exceptional case doctrine. And until you, that debate is resolved, it's really hard to know the answer to your question about how much space it's going to take up and preclude the need to invoke any of the other two doctrines, delegation or get rid of Chevron. Um, as, as far as uh, delegation, it also will come up independently in cases in which Congress has given, um, uh, you know, a lots of authority clearly. And so the preventive care, and Andy knows much more about this case than I do. So hopefully he'll speak to it. Um, but, um, you know, it's a clear delegation of authority. And so it gets by the major question doctrine, and it's going to present a straight up uh, delegation question. The court has a case this term where, um, authority has been delegated to Indian tribes to uh, switch priorities in um, uh, not clear that there's much of a standard there. There may be, uh, but probably not the kind of standard that there's a clear delegation, uh, not the kind of uh, standard that the, the majority, I mean, the dissenters in Gundy are looking for. And so therefore it could come up in that case. So delegation is going to have independent force particularly if this dialogue continues. So if you get a Congress that gives, you know, public need, public interest authority, do whatever you think is well in the public interest in a new one of those statutes, um, then it, it's, you know, and we mean it, whatever you think is in the public interest, that's still going to present this delegation question down the road. Um. Well, just to two points. One on, on the, the question. I think another question about the major question doctrine is how specific do you have to be? I think in the vaccine cases, Justice Gorsuch thought requiring vaccination or testing is so intrusive that if the statute didn't use the word vaccination, uh, that it didn't pass muster under the, it wasn't clear enough under the major question doctrine. So there's a question about how broad major is, and then there's a question about how clear clear is, uh, that I, neither of which I think have been resolved. I mean, Irv mentioned this Affordable Care Act case that was decided last week, and it's a case about the ACA requires that insurers, uh, and this is all insurers, not just marketplace insurers, cover various preventative services without cost sharing for the uh, customer. And uh, a judge in Texas, uh, one of those things uh, says, essentially, preventative services rated A or B by the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force. That's basically what the statute says. At the time, the task force had standards for making those decisions, but Congress didn't put them in the statute. And so although this claim wasn't accepted in the case, one of the non-delegation claims there is the statute doesn't say what the standards are, and therefore... It violates the non-delegation doctrine. Ali, I will defer that to you on this, but uh, do you think, should we stop now or take another? I think we probably should move to the side. Well, please join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>